You want to invest in ETFs, but you don't know which one, you don't know where to start. I show you a very simple two-step process how to select the ETF to invest in. Let's not waste too much time and go straight to phase one. Phase one, you need to define the purpose of your investment, the purpose of your money. This is actually really important to understand how long can you commit to an investment and what amount of risk and volatility are you able to accept. So an example for this would be, let's say you're 40 years old and you want to save and invest for your retirement. You can commit to at least 20 years. You will probably need the money only in 30 years. And you can accept a lot of volatility because you don't need the money in five years. So it doesn't matter what amount that will be in five years. It only counts what it will be in 20, 30 years. On the other end of the spectrum is like an emergency fund. You need this money on short notice and you can't accept that there's a high volatility involved and suddenly your money is only worth half as much. And then there's stuff in between. Let's say you are saving up for a house to live in. You might buy one in two, three years, maybe in one, maybe in four. You don't know exactly. You don't know the amount. You can accept a lot of volatility and risk, but a little bit yes. And you can probably commit to two or three years. And then there's some parking lot money scenario where you know you have to make a big payment, let's say along a payment schedule of a construction project you have, you need to make a payment in half a year, in one year, maybe one and a half years. You already know that very precisely. You want a safe parking lot where it gives you some degree of interest but you can't really accept much volatility or risk here. So these are a couple of sample scenarios and be very clear in which of these areas your specific bucket of money is located. And based on that, you choose the asset or the ETF asset allocation model that you want to invest in. So there are four categories, four quadrants of this matrix, long-term, short-term, high-risk, low-risk. And when you look at short-term, high-risk, you better go to a casino. When you look at long-term, low-risk, that would be a savings account or something, but you lose out a lot of money on the inflation. So you should not do that one either. What does make sense is long-term equity investment long-term, medium to high risk, and the asset class for that would be equity, stock market index funds. And in the short run, you can't accept much risk. It's not that long. So the asset class for that would be fixed income. So really, as far as ETFs are concerned, we have these two asset classes. And depending on your purpose of that specific money bucket, you go for equity or you go for fixed income. And within these, we also have different levels of volatility that we can accept and different durations that we anticipate. So let's jump to step two, finding the actual ETF you want to invest in. Go to Google or Bing or the search engine of your choice and type in ETF finder, ETF search, something like that. There are plenty of websites that help you to filter out the huge range of ETFs that are available in the market. And the first criteria we need to filter for is the total expense ratio. We want to go for a low cost fund because the fees add up in the long run. It's a lot of money if you invest it over a couple decades. And these fees can be one or two percent that you can save. So you can go super low on the fees or it can go three, four percent. And that adds up to hundreds of thousands of dollars over the decades you will be invested in. So filter the ETFs by a total expense ratio of less than 0.1 percent. That is doable. There are very good funds in that range. And that's already reads out a huge range of ETFs that are not good for you because they're simply too expensive and not returning value that compensates for that high expense. Now let's start with a long-term scenario and let's filter for equity ETFs. And here we already see 
at the top of the list, if he is sought by low expense ratio, we already see some of the best choices. Standard & Poor's 500 index fund is one of the best ETFs, comes with a very low expense ratio and a very, very high long-term return, at least in the past. This fund invests in close to 500 shares that are typically global companies, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, the big ones. It covers all the industries from the manufacturers of your phone to your car, to your cereal that you have for breakfast, or the company that provides the electricity, the oil in your car. The whole economy is reflected in this one ETF and that gives it a fairly low volatility. You're basically safe from market rotation from one industry and another. You're really set up for the long run going through all the ups and downs. And then we can go through a huge list of exclusion criteria. And the most important one was already the expense ratio. With that, we already exclude most of the actively managed funds. You want to have a cheap actively managed funds, and that is good because they typically don't offer any additional return. They just come with higher fees. But the idea that some fund manager beats the market on a continuous basis is basically just a marketing story that they tell you to make you pay higher fees. But statistically, you are not beating the market. So you better go just with an ETF index fund. Now, another temptation is to go with sector funds. So there's a lot of buzz in media about specific ideas that are going to change the world in the next years or decades, be it AI, be it cybersecurity, be it uh, biotechnology, all of these things, right? These are typically hyped up. And by the time the mutual fund companies have a fund to reflect this market out to the retail investors, so you can invest in it, there's already so much hype in that segment that the prices are completely inflated and you as a retail investor will be the one holding the bag when the prices go down. So it's typically a bad investment. Stay away from that. Another temptation to withstand are dividend funds. We all like the feeling of getting dividends. It's just free money we get. It's passive income in its truest form. And it just feels good to get the money onto your bank account. However, dividend funds do not outperform the market. It's typically companies that have a low growth. They give a big chunk of the profit back to the investors and do not invest in the future of their company. Also, you have some kind of tax involved typically that might be your income tax, that might be tax based on where the companies or the fund are located. It's a very complicated tax setup, but by and large, you will not outperform the index fund. You just get the good feeling of money in your bank account. But you might as well on an ongoing basis sell some of your shares or sell some of your ETFs. That gives you the money you need. And you can do that when you need the money and not when the company wants to get out some of the profits to the investors. Now let's look at the other segment. Let's look at fixed income. Here we have a huge range from very high risk to very low risk. And this is mostly reflected by the duration of the underlying investments. Make sure your fixed income fund has a large number of investments in its portfolio. So each of them is typically less than 1%. So the risk that some of the companies you're lending out your money to cannot pay you back is really, really minimal if you have thousands of companies or governments you lend your money to. So the big risk that you have in fixed income funds should be changes in the interest rates overall in the market. And that can be very significant as we have seen in the last couple of years where the interest rates increased in a fairly short time from close to nothing to, well, five, six, seven percent. 
and that has a huge impact on your ETFs or fixed income investments depending on the duration of your investment. So if you're going on the very long end, 30 years, you have a high risk exposure to rising interest rates, but typically you would get a higher return. On the short term end, that can be just a few months or so, you have a very low interest. So match that to the risk you can stomach with this bucket of investment. So for your emergency fund, go for some money market funds. They have a very, very, very short duration and close to zero risk, but they give you very, very limited returns. And if you want to invest in for two or three years at least, you can go for a mid-range duration of, let's say, five to eight years. So with this, you can choose the ETFs that fit your risk profile. And another factor con to consider are the foreign exchange rates. Depending on where you are, and with that, I mean actually mostly where you want to spend the money that you're investing at some point in the future, what currency that will be, you should reduce your exposure to that market. Let's say you are in the United States, you want to retire there, perfectly fine to have a very, very high allocation in US dollar investments. If you are living in Australia, for example, and you plan to retire there, you would have the risk of the US dollar going down in value compared to the Australian dollar if you have a very high exposure to US dollar. So do allocate to some extent also in the market where you plan to spend the money later on, if that is a good option, if there are good investments in that market. So I hope these two steps help you to identify a couple of investments, a couple of ETFs, and you really don't need many, and you should not have many, to get started with your ETF investments. And if you want to learn more about investing in real estate, short-term rentals or ETFs, any of that, building businesses, follow this channel for more content like this.